Okay, the shunt first of all. Lewis Hamilton's rejoining, but he's rejoining the race in front of Max Verstappen. He's cleared the white line, and so therefore he's back on the racetrack. He's in front of Max, and he's on the inside going into turn one. So what's he gonna do? Is he gonna back right off and let Max Verstappen go? Of course, he's not gonna do that. I suppose the only thing you can say at that point is that Lewis then didn't give Max enough room to be able to go around outside him and then on the inside for the exit out of turn two. But then why would he? Equally, let's look at it from Max Verstappen's viewpoint. He's, he's just been brilliantly quick after a very long pit stop. He's just had his first flying lap really fast. He's got the momentum, but he's shocked that he's lost so much time. He's probably lost the race now to the McLarens. And here's Lewis Hamilton out of his right peripheral vision rejoining just in front of him. And this, of course, is where it goes wrong because he thinks, yeah, I can do this. I've got the momentum. I've got the hotter tires. And then Lewis will probably have to back away and give me the corner. Of course, Lewis was never going to do that. And Max would have known that if he'd thought about it uh, from Silverstone. So I think, you know, you could say a racing accident in the sense that neither driver gave the other enough room to be able to go around turns one and two side by side as Lando Norris later did with Charles Leclerc when he had a really good run on Charles Leclerc at the restart, but realized he wasn't going to be able to do it cleanly and then gave the position kind of to Charles and then got him on the acceleration run into the Curva Grande, which of course what is what could have happened had Max not tried to pass Lewis at turn one. He probably would have had the momentum going into the Curva Grande, just as at Silverstone, he probably would have got Lewis down the hangar straight. So going back to this, I think you can say racing accident in the sense that neither of them, as I say, gave one another enough room. But I think you could also say, and as I record this, the stewards are still deliberating over the whole thing, that it was Lewis's corner. He was in front and he was down the inside. So anything that happened thereafter happened because Max on hotter tires was going to try and go around the outside of the first part of turn one. But it all went wrong when Max, finding himself being squeezed for space, had to go up on the curbs on the inside of the left hand, turn two if you like, second part of the chicane, flicked the Red Bull up and flicked it up into the Mercedes. And here we just have to press pause and say, wow, what a job the roll hoop and the halo did to protect Lewis Hamilton. This could have been a horrendous accident. We're talking head injuries here in years past for sure. But to see in slow-mo the way the floor of the Red Bull just crumpled like a wafer as it hit the roll hoop and the halo. Thumbs up yet again to everybody at the FIA and the teams who's been working so hard on the survival cell system in Formula One. Just staggering to see how Lewis was able to get out of that car and walk away. Great to see as well, of course. So if you had to say if it was either one or the other, I would say it was more Max than it was Lewis. Under the heading of, we are now in a world championship that feels like Senna Prost, 1988. It feels like that. These two iconic drivers, and I've used that phrase before, because they are head to head in situations like this. It is gonna be amazing, I think, the rest of the season now, because Lewis, well, Lewis knows what to expect from Max, and Lewis is Lewis. He's never gonna change. He's the ultimate racing driver in so many ways. He's, he's kept his motivation so solid, despite all the success, despite all the, all the fame. But Max Verstappen is a raw, angry racing driver now. And that's probably the Max we're going to see between now and the end of the year. It'll be really interesting to see how Red Bull tame him and how they contain that. But from now on, whenever Max and Lewis are near one another, um, I think the fans can just stand back and say, wow, you know, this is going to be a season to remember. And at this point, I think it's worth looking, tracing back to see how the two drivers got into that situation. As I say, in the race, it was kind of colored by Max's very slow pit stop. And in Lewis's case, it was colored by starting the race on the hard tire, something he was obliged to do in effect after what happened yesterday in the sprint race. Well, go back even further for Lewis because he's probably thinking now, if Mercedes hadn't compromised Q3, the second run in Q3 for Lewis, when he had to give a bit of a toe to Valtteri, because at that point they were very, very keen to have a lockout on the front row. The Mercedes thinking was, if we can have a lockout on the front row, we've got a very good chance of Lewis winning the sprint race and therefore getting the pole for the Grand Prix. And that's where we want to go. We seem to have the quickest car driver package here, but it kind of all started to go wrong when they played around with that and the pole went 
to Valtteri Bottas. That meant, as I said yesterday, that Lewis then had to start on the dirty side of the grid. And then it was compounded by Mercedes not anticipating what McLaren were going to do and put their cars onto the soft tyre. Mercedes started on the medium. Lewis got blown away from the dirty side of the grid. And all of a sudden, he's starting the Grand Prix proper P4 again on the dirty side of the road. So now Mercedes are thinking, we potentially going to be behind the McLarens. What are we going to do? How are we going to beat them? Very difficult to overtake at Monza, very difficult to get within a second of the car in front. What we need to do is run a different strategy. And on the basis that probably everyone is going to go for medium, but Lewis and Valtteri Bottas at the back of the grid because of that penalty he had for his power unit change started on the hard. And the thinking was run a longer first stint, obviously gain track position, see if we can get past the McLarens and hopefully the Red Bull that way. Well, that didn't work out either. Max Verstappen made a pretty good start. Daniel Ricciardo made an even better start and took the lead into turn one. Lewis actually made a pretty good start on those hard tyres from the dirty side of the grid, surprisingly enough, and actually got ahead of Lando Norris in the first phase of the lap. But then, in a way, it was a prelude to what we were going to see later. Lewis caught Max Verstappen pretty well coming into the second chicane, was on the outside in the braking area. And then Max did what he was always going to do, he used all the road. And Lewis had no alternative but to sort of straight line the chicane, bump over the curbs and rejoin the track. At which point, of course, Lando Norris then got ahead of him. Lewis got on the radio and said, he forced me off, but, or well, he didn't give me any room. But then, you know, on the outside going into that left-hander, oh, isn't that what happened at turn one later on in the race? So yeah, that was definitely and probably in the back of the minds of both drivers as they then face one another after that first set of pit stops. For the remainder of the medium tyre stint, there was nothing that Max or Lewis could do about the two McLarens. And so there, obviously, for Mercedes, the big card to play was the longevity of that first stint on the hard tyre for Lewis Hamilton. Well, as it happened, they only ran about three or four laps more than the longest running medium tyre car. It didn't really give him an advantage, and he wasn't that quick going into his pit stop anyway. So by the time he rejoined, he was alongside Max Verstappen, who'd started on the medium and had an 11 second pit stop. Lewis's pit stop was something like four seconds. So you're looking at a massive amount of time that Lewis had lost actually in those laps going in to the pits. And anyway, he came out of the pits, down the acceleration lane, the white lines on the left, he did everything perfectly, went into turn one. And of course there was Max Verstappen and the shunt happened. So if Lewis wanted to trace that back to Friday, when he is very quick out of the box at Monza in the Mercedes, looking like the driver who's got every chance of winning the Italian Grand Prix, it went wrong, first of all, the initial qualifying. It went doubly wrong in the sprint race when they didn't put him on the right tyres. And then, of course, it went wrong in the race when he started on the hard tyre and didn't really get an advantage from it. You could say an unfortunate situation. I think for Formula One, it is a brilliant situation. I say that cynically, kind of. But to have these two iconic drivers, and I've used that word before, wheel to wheel like this and not giving one another room at that first chicane, which is very easy to do. I think all that needs to be seen in the context of Lando Norris's driving today, which I thought was absolutely superb. He was brilliant in defense with, with Lewis behind him for that first phase of the race. Absolutely stunning. Very few errors, perfect under braking, even when the tires started to go off. And then at the restart, after that Lewis Max shunt, he found himself behind Charles Leclerc's Ferrari, which again track position because of the opportune pit stops afforded by the safety car. And as they went into turn one at the restart, Lando was in a position to really force the issue with Charles going into that turn one, but he didn't. He backed away just enough for both of them to get through. It was a superb bit of driving, as I say, and a good example of how two cars can go through there. And then immediately afterwards, Lando pulled off the pass of the race, just superb on the inside through the Curva Grande, getting a run because Charles balked a little bit coming out of the corner, getting a run on the inside at Curva Grande and then taking the, taking the, the position going into the second chicane. So really good drive from Lando in that respect. And we're just comparing him there with how he handled that first chicane when he was in traffic. Um, so that's how they got there. <laughs> the winner of the race, though, was Daniel Ricciardo, who's been looking like the real Daniel Ricciardo of old ever since Spa, ever since Lando shunt at Spa, actually. He was really quick just after that. He was good at Zandvoort, and here he was at Monza. It reminds me a little bit of Daniel's last radio message for, after the Dutch Grand Prix at Zandvoort last weekend when uh, he was doing one of his Daniel things where he doesn't say anything but actually says a lot and he was doing he was, he was yeah well yeah okay yeah 
Yeah, good. Well, okay, okay, let's go to Monza. It was just like, okay, we'll see what happens at Monza. And, you know, at round Monza in a good car like the McLaren Mercedes, there was never going to be much between Daniel Ricciardo and Lando Norris. It's, a, it's not the sort of circuit where a Lando over a race distance is going to do anything a lot different from Daniel Ricciardo, particularly if it's a Daniel now who's got confidence in the car and he's got that beautiful touch, which we've always talked about. What he hasn't had in recent times compared with Lando is that commitment for an early entry into the corner using less road and that trade-off. But Daniel's never really been one of those. He's just a super soft, lovely to watch racing driver who's really good in traffic. And he made a great start, don't forget, into the sprint first corner. And he made another phenomenal start today uh, from the dirty side of the grid on medium tires. Just brilliant how he took the lead there and then pulled away. And yeah, towards the end of the race, there was a moment when Valtteri Bottas had set fastest lap. Uh, he'd started from the back, as we know, after all these power unit changes. And there was a moment when McLaren saw that, he, that Valtteri had set fastest lap. He was on medium tyres because he'd started on the hard tyre like Lewis as well. And the message was, Lando, you know, we, we're telling Daniel to go quicker because Valtteri's looking strong. And at that moment, you thought maybe, maybe, maybe Lando has more pace in that car. But Lando, to his credit, and here's another thing that he did so well, immediately got on the radio basically and said, what's best for the team? And they said, well, stay where you are is best for the team, but both of you go quicker. And that was a really impressive thing, I thought, for Lando to do at that moment of the race. You imagine, I don't know, you imagine Ralph Schumacher in that position in the Jordan days. No, thank you. It wouldn't have happened at all. Not many quick drivers, actually, in that situation would have been as calm and mature as, as Lando was feeling that the win was there, but having to, on this occasion, uh, give it to Daniel, his teammate. But he did so with grace, and he did so, I think, with a lot of credit for the future as well. And it was interesting, I thought, after the initial interview thing, as they're going up to the podium, that it was Lando that Zach was sort of walking with, Zach Brown, that is, uh, and, and giving energy to, because this was a moment to say to Lando, Great job, great job for the team. This will not be forgotten. And I thought he just drove superbly. Anyway, getting back to, to Daniel, um, I don't know if you've noticed, but last week McLaren uh, on their website put out a new range of pink Daniel Ricciardo merch, which was all, which is all to do with charity, obviously. And uh, what a what a weekend I think then to follow that. And uh, here's an example of the cap, for example. So. So go and buy it because this cap will now always be synonymous with this amazing win in the Italian Grand Prix. It's strange, isn't it, how the Monza, uh, the Italian Grand Prix is producing all these um, different winners. I mean, last year, obviously, it was Pierre Gasly. We've had plenty in the past and um, in the slipstreaming past, particularly think of Peter Gethin as a good example. Um, but, um, but this was a really impressive day, wasn't it? It was a one two for McLaren Mercedes. And this was, a, this was a day when McLaren Mercedes, absolutely for sure, without any shadow of a doubt, jumped from the high midfield to being regular contenders. Okay, maybe they don't have the absolute inherent downforce they need to be really competitive alongside a Red Bull or even a Mercedes on a high downforce circuit. But not all circuits are high downforce. And it's difficult now to see that McLaren won't be building on this momentum and being really, really competitive against the front runners, by which I mean Red Bull and Mercedes, from here on in, just a fabulous result. You don't get a one-two unless you've got virtually all of the boxes ticked as to where you're going with the team and the development of the car. So full credit to everybody at McLaren uh, behind that win. Um, that one-two finish, just stunning to see. And good to see Emerson Vitabaldi in the McLaren garage, a guest of McLaren throughout the Monza weekend as well, looking fit and well. Emerson, of course, won his second world championship with McLaren, and it was McLaren's first Formula One world championship. So that was a very significant time. And Emerson, a massive role in the heritage of the team that just finished one two today at Monza. He would have loved seeing that, I'm sure. Charles Leclerc did a really good job in the Ferrari. He hasn't been feeling great all weekend, hasn't been feeling great about the car all weekend either. And they put in, uh, and they changed engines last night, power units last night, went back to one of the older ones, so there was no penalty involved. But that just shows that there's something that hasn't felt right about that package all weekend. Carlos Sainz kind of followed Charles around at a distance throughout the race, lost time early on the first lap. And poor old Antonio Giovinazzi of Alfa didn't 
capitalize on his great qualifying position and at a moment at the chicane ran wide and rejoined effectively in the front of Carlos Sainz although watching it from Carlos's position a bit like Max you could say a bit of a surprise he didn't just give Antonio a little bit of room there but you know for sure ultimately it was always going to be a penalty for Giovinazzi out of the second chicane there on the opening lap. Now, Robert Kubica in the other car standing in for Kimi uh, who's tested positive for Covid actually did a very good job and was running just outside the top 10 at the restart. He got kind of swamped towards the end of the race but bearing in mind how difficult it is just to jump into a car and do the job Robert I thought did very well today and, um, and in addition to that I should just say that I wasn't impressed with Yuki Tsunoda in qualifying when after Q1 or during Q1 he had an incident with Robert going into the second chicane and he just got on the radio and said Kubica idiot and I just thought yeah okay even if Robert perhaps did something wrong there a young driver rookie driver in Formula One shouldn't be saying things like that on the radio about a driver of Robert Kubica's stature I think it's inappropriate I'm surprised that I think in this world now, I think we should start to be looking at sanctioning comments like that because it's not appropriate. In other sports now, you say something like that and it would be clamped down upon. Anyway, that's just my opinion. And so breathlessly, we come to the end of this triple header in Formula One uh, and we come to it with this astonishing moment between Max and Lewis, which, pro which, which will become the trademark of the 2021 World Championship for sure, regardless of which way it goes. But what it does mean for now, not being able to look into the future with great detail, what it means now is that we do have a World Championship, a serious World Championship ahead of us. And so roll on the next race, which of course is Sochi in Russia, with long straights that should suit the Mercedes, but equally with enough corners and braking areas and changes of direction to suit the Red Bull. Looks like it's gonna be close there as well. Thanks for watching and subscribing. Thanks to Jetcraft, the support of this channel. See you soon.